Hi, welcome. How's it going? I decided I'd record a bunch of these. Oh, I was busy doing something else and it was, it just wasn't happening and it was making me really frustrated, but I'm making up for lost time. So today I'm talking about the Z pre-pass and more broadly, I'm also talking about methods of reducing overdraw. So if we look at this scene on the right, we have a b whole bunch of cubes and we can see the top surfaces, of course, but a lot of these surfaces are going to be overwritten multiple times. Now, uh, OpenGL enforces bad habits sometimes because the, the GPU is so good at handling things that sometimes it is preferable to just throw it all at the GPU and it sort of all comes out in the wash. But in cases when the lighting calculations are particularly complex, then overdraw can become a real problem. We have a number of strategies to deal with it. Now, I always have to bring it up. Ray tracing is always an option. And the advantage that you get with ray tracing over traditional triangles is that with ray tracing, you have logarithmic, you know, O log N um, trace time intersection tests to find an underlying triangle. Whereas in a naive rendering system, you're just throwing triangles at the screen. That's O N more or less, if that makes sense. Um, but obviously that's sort of a meme answer. That's sort of scratching the surface. Like there are a whole lot of things that you need to get right to get ray tracing working. Um, but I just thought I'd say that. Now, another common approach is deferred shading or deferred rendering. And the basic idea is that you have a geometry pass and then you have a lighting pass. And in the geometry pass, yeah, you throw everything at the screen, but you do not perform the complicated calculations of lighting or anything like that. All you're doing is you're throwing stuff at the screen and you're basically taking a picture of what's visible on the screen and you're saving a whole bunch of info. You're saving the positions in either view space or world space, however you want to do it. Then you're also saving the normals and you're saving a whole bunch of other data like the underlying texture values and, and things like that. And then you've got all the info, all the state that you need to light it. You just haven't applied lighting yet. So then later on, when you go and apply lighting, the lighting is only being applied to things which are ac actually visible. So there are some benefits to that. There are also some drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is that in some sense, you haven't solved the original problem of overdraw. You've reduced the overhead because you're not doing expensive calculations, but there is still some overdraw. And then the other issue is that you have a whole bunch of different textures, like you have an albedo texture, a uh, normal texture and all that. And with all those textures, you're passing around a lot of uh, large global memory things, and that can really slow things down as well. Um, and then another option is to pre-order. So you have all your objects in your world. If you have some sort of reasonably fast algorithm that can sort them according to their distance to the viewer, then draw the closer things first. Then when you go to draw the further away things, they do not get drawn. The vertex shader runs, of course, because you have to calculate the positions and stuff. But then when it comes to the fragment shader, the fragment shader will immediately see that it's drawing something which is further away from the screen than what's already on there and that expensive fragment shader won't run. So that's another option. And then the last option, which I'm investigating today, is the Z pre-pass. So what you do is you have a really simple draw call, and the only reason you do it is you want to populate the depth buffer so that then when you go and actually do the proper render, the depth buffer depth values are already there. And it autom like you lose, there's no overdraw, basically. Because if something, because, mm, what am I going to say? Because the depth buffer has already been filled with the appropriate value. So you go to draw something further away. The depth test says, no, that's not going to pass. Now, this is a reasonable question. Isn't it wasteful to render the scene twice? And yeah, it is. It is. So there's a trade-off with this technique. If, okay, what am I going to say? If there's a way to somehow use the pre-written depth buffer information with along with other techniques like screen space techniques 
then there's a further benefit to it. But roughly speaking, there is some trade-off between these techniques. But one thing, especially that the beginners don't, or that I don't, um, didn't quite factor in, is that you actually don't need a fragment shader if you're going to simply capture info and write to the depth buffer. The depth buffer automatically gets written to by the rasterizer. The job of the fragment shader is to put a color on the screen, but if all you're doing is rendering off screen, then you don't need it. And then another important thing to mention is that this, is, this technique is often, it's also referred to as an early fragment test or an early depth test. It's important to remember the way the depth test works. So when we go and render our scene later on, we go and the question is, what happens? Okay, I'm talking around in circles because I didn't plan on mentioning this, but then I just thought of it, so I'll mention it. When you go, the question is, does the depth test occur before the fragment shader or after? And the quick answer is it's an optimization that if the fragment shader does not include, if the fragment shader does not write to the depth buffer, then the depth test is performed first. And so all you need to do is make sure the fragment shader isn't writing like GL frag depth. And yeah, you have a, tr a true proper early depth test. But anyway, the big question is when is a, a Z or a Z pre-pass a viable option? And I'll be upfront, I'm gonna do a demonstration, but I did not get any performance benefit from it. I guess my fragment shader wasn't expensive enough. So the fact is that you are running a vertex shader twice. So yeah, as you can see here, the cost of the shading the pixels, the fragment shader must or should be significantly higher than the cost of running the vertex shader. Um, and then the other thing I've got here is, yeah, a partial Z prepass. So imagine you've got a rectangle and the rectangle is somewhere on the screen. If that rectangle is really close, it'll be covering a really large portion of the screen. That is going to have a large amount of fragments per vertex, if that makes sense. And so in that case, it might be a good idea to include that as one of the objects which gets rendered in the Z prepass, but just to do a partial Z prepass. So we don't have to run this thing. We don't have to run the fragment shader a bunch of times for every single object in the scene, just objects which are significantly big. And it is a bit of fine tuning there. But I mean, having said all of this, I am gonna jump into a demo just to show how I got it working. Alrighty, so here we are in the environment. This is just a, a sort of a, what am I thinking? It's a blank, just straight up render test. We have a whole bunch of cubes. Give that a second. There we go. Okay. So this is running at 104 frames per second with specular lighting on all of these cubes. Looks pretty good. Can we just have a second to appreciate that a Python program is running with about 16,000 cubes at 100 frames per second with updates on all of them. That's due to two things. Firstly, instance rendering, but instance rendering isn't gonna update the cubes. That's CPU work. And so what's making that CPU work faster is that I'm using number to just-in-time compile, which I've talked about in previous videos. This is more of a data-oriented design. But yeah, so there we have it. That's just the standard sort of test case we can see here. Yeah, about 16,300 cubes or so. Okay, so how do we take this and then add a depth prepass to that? Okay, so here we go. This is the code with the depth prepass. Now, like I said, performance is the same, it turns out, because I guess the fragment shader is not significantly expensive that we're saving much. But here's how it goes. We have this vertex fragment and then this depth prepass. All this depth prepass does is write a position to the screen. That's all it has to do. 
It's just that, it's just like a, a simple vertex shader, nothing else. So when we go and create this, we have the shader, that's the standard stuff, and then we have this depth shader, and all this depth shader is doing is it just takes <clears throat> that vertex shader, and that's all. There's no fragment shader in this, but the rasterizer is writing to the depth buffer. And we can actually verify this. So I will, well, let's have a quick look at, at how this rendering is working. So all we do is at the top of the frame, clear the depth buffer. That makes sure it has like blank values in it. And then we run the depth prepass. It's pretty much just draw everything in the scene. And then we go ahead and run the um, the regular render. Of course, we don't need to send the data over again. We've already done that. But that will be using the depth value which was set in the prepass. So again, give this a shot and we will get, yeah, the same frame rate. But what I was gonna show is we can verify that this is actually writing the depth buffer correctly if we go and if we go and change the depth test. So if we change it to less, then only nearer fragments will be drawn. But guess what? Nothing. Because we already wrote the whole, like we're covered in cubes right now and we've, we've written those values. We can actually accentuate that again by dropping the number of cubes. This mustn't be a lot of fun to watch, but if we drop the number of cubes down, we'll start to see gaps between them. There we go. So these things, the depth value has been written at these points. It's just failing the depth test because I had the wrong value set there. But if we go down to the depth test and say, okay, let's go equal. That shouldn't change anything. Uh, oh, not great. Okay, let's not do that. There we go. So yeah, I mean, like I said, we're verifying that the depth buffer is being written to. Okay, sort of a long-winded thing, and it's, it's a little disappointing that we didn't get any benefits, but that could also come down to my graphics card. So if you have a graphics card where specular lighting is particularly expensive, then again, you may benefit from a depth prepass. Anyway, yeah, that's it. Have a good one. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.